News Journalism. Two decades ago, a pocket-sized device called the iPod revolutionized how we listen to music. Tonight, longtime radio host Alan Cross takes us through that and his 40 years spinning new music on the airwaves across Southern Ontario. Then, the year that was in Canadian music and how we used playlists and streaming to help drown out the pandemic. It's Tuesday, December 14th, and that's next on The Agenda. Last century, as in the 1990s, if you wanted to hear your new favorite song, you'd grab the CD and seamlessly skip to the track you wanted. It felt luxuriously easy and portable compared to everything before, especially cassette tapes. Then a little invention from Apple came along that literally put hundreds of songs at your fingertips. Launched 20 years ago, the iPod transformed music listening forever. Alan Cross is the host of The Ongoing History of New Music on 102.1 The Edge and is co-author of the new book, The Science of Song, How and Why We Make Music. This year also marks his 40th year on the radio and we're pleased to welcome him back to our airwaves from the downtown of Ontario's capital city for the long view on all of this. Alan, first of all, my goodness, 40 years. Congratulations. That's a hell of an achievement, my friend. Well done. Oh, well, thank you. I had no expectations when I started doing this that I would still be doing it 40 years later. But uh, I have no other personal or portable skills, so I guess this is, uh, this is my lot. <laughs> right on. Okay. Well, let's go back uh, not too long ago, a couple of months ago. It was October 23rd, actually, 2001, uh, that the iPod debuted. That anniversary came and that anniversary left without a heck of a lot of fanfare. How come? Because Apple is a forward-looking company, they don't really tend to spend a lot of time looking on the history of products that really don't matter anymore. I mean, they will forever sing the praises of the first Macintosh computer that came out in 1984, uh, and they will probably talk about... Uh, well, I can't think of anything else. <laughs> the, the whole idea is that they're, they're moving forward. The, the iPod enjoyed a very, very big... Uh, uh, period of, of, of popularity and then the iPhone came along it basically ate its lunch it cannibalized most iPod sales and now there's only one uh, model available and that's the iPod touch which is essentially an iPhone without a phone and it is uh, they don't even break out the numbers now when they give their quarterly reports it's just part of other hardware I suppose well, we do like to look back on this program, so we are going to look back 20 years ago, and the world got introduced to the iPod with a commercial that, as the kids say, looked a little something like this. Sheldon, if you would. Now that does bring back some sweet memories there. And uh, let me ask you, uh, they were not holding protests at the corner of Young and Bloor demanding this kind of product. So why did Apple launch it in the first place? Because they wanted to get uh, first mover advantage in the marketplace beyond a couple of South Korean companies. Steve Jobs realized that Apple was in big, big trouble. He had come back to the company in the late 90s, pared down their product line, came out with the brand new, remember the, the multicolored uh, IMAX that you just pulled out of the box and plugged in and they worked? He believed that the music was a big part of Apple's uh, ecosystem and a part of their DNA. So uh, hey, he had seen a couple of portable MP3 players that had come out of South Korea that didn't do very well and were almost legislated out of existence because there was a very big concern that this was copyright infringement, the record labels really didn't like it. Uh, and uh, what, what ended up happening is that the those devices from the South Korean companies were made uh, legal or declared legal based on a 1976 ruling uh, against Disney and Universal, who sued Sony over something called the Betamax VCR. <laughs> anyway, so if if if, the, if we were ripping songs for personal use on these devices, uh, it was no different than creating uh, videotapes of programs that you may have missed. So Steve Jobs wanted to get a, a piece of this action. He honestly believed that music was the way forward. Uh, I had a friend who was working as a scriptwriter in uh, Los Angeles at the time, and he got a call from his agent, 
And he and his writing partner went up to Cupertino, where they met with Steve Jobs in the summer of 2001. And he gave them the whole Steve Jobs presentation about this new thing that was going to allow for a thousand songs in your pocket. And he, they were signed to all kinds of uh, non-disclosure agreements, and they were going to make a promotional film of the whole thing that never really happened. But uh, Rob was, uh, my friend, was really, really intrigued by this whole thing. And uh, what we learned later that this uh, device was called, codenamed the P38 Dulcimer. <laughs> and it was not developed entirely in-house with Apple. They bought some uh, existing hardware. They bought another company that had some of this hardware. and But they pushed it all through in about 11 months. So from start to finish, the whole iPod thing happened in, in 11 months and came out in October of 20, uh, October 23rd, uh, 2001. And at first, not a lot of people noticed because it was in the fog of 9-11. It was something that was released when everybody was still getting their you know, heads back together after that terrible day. And uh, it sold slowly at first, but everybody who got their hands on it realized that this was a magical thing that worked better than anything else out in the marketplace. And it looked cool. And uh, let's not forget the fact that they all had, you know, these white earbuds hmm. or white headphones that, you know, if you, even if you had the thing under your jacket and you walked past and people saw you wearing the white earbuds, they knew uh, you had an iPod and you were on the cutting edge of things. So that was one thing that made it better than uh, some of the other MP3 players out there. What else made it superior to the competition? Well, it didn't skip uh, because what Apple had done is gone to Hitachi and bought up their entire inventory of 1.8 inch hard drives, and basically cornering the market on those tiny, tiny hard drives. And uh, based using that hardware and a system of what's called nested menus with the software, the thing just worked really, really well. They also had uh, iTunes, of course, which was at first just a, a CD ripping program. It worked seamlessly with the iPod using a, a technology called Firewire. So you could load up a thousand songs in, in mere minutes, which I, I had a couple of really early MP3 players. And uh, the quality of the audio was terrible because the um, the, the capacity, the storage capacity was so low and uh, you could only get maybe 30 songs or 35 songs in a, in, a, in a decent audio quality. The iPod comes along and you get a thousand songs in your pocket and they all sound great. Uh, and the headphones also helped too, the earbuds helped too because they also sounded very, very good. And it was so easy to use. It was intuitive. And even, I remember being, you know, playing with the, the first one, um, uh, somebody at work had bought one and it was like, Whoa! This, uh, this I got it in ten seconds. That that was how remarkable it was. And at its peak, how much of the market did iPod own? Pretty much all of it. <laughs> it was probably eighty percent, seventy percent. Everybody needed to have an iPod, and they iterated fairly quickly. There was the the traditional one that was the size of a deck of a, a deck of cards, and then the next one, which was the iPod Nano. Uh, and that was my entry drug into the whole Apple ecosystem. Um, it was smaller. I think it was four gigabytes. It was cheaper. And uh, instead of buying a big one, because I didn't understand the need to have, you know, a thousand songs in my pocket. Uh, but, you know, uh, 400. Yeah, I could I could live with that. But then they kept getting better. They kept getting bigger. They kept getting more interesting looking. There was. Uh, uh, oh, I, had not, I didn't have the iPod Nano. I had the iPod Mini. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then the Nano came along and then all these other variations until the Touch came out in 2000, I want to say 2006. And I remember seeing the TV series, the TV commercial for that thinking, I got to have one of those things now. <laughs> and I went up the next day and, and got one. Now, we have to remember that this, uh, this is, after all, a gizmo. It is not the actual music. It is a way of playing the music. But of course, it was so mm -hmm. revolutionary that it did change musical trends. How so? Well, here's the big one, uh, and you can't talk about the iPod without talking about iTunes. iTunes was presented to the record uh, industry by Steve Jobs at a time when everybody was dying because of file trading and piracy. And the record labels could not get together to do anything uh, as a group because that would have violated antitrust rules. 
So they needed an outside person to come in to provide a storefront digital solution for selling music this way as a way of, of you know, meeting customer demand and also as a way of combating privacy. So uh, with, with iTunes, um, what you had at, originally was just something that would rip CDs. Then it became the store. And one of the things about the store was albums were de were deconstructed into their individual tracks. Not all of them at first, but most of them. So rather than buying an entire album for whatever the price might be, $10.99, $12.99, or so on, you could buy just the songs you wanted. And this was a really big deal because if you remember back to the late 1990s, the big criticism was – we were getting albums with one or two good songs on it, and the rest was was junk. At the same time, the recorded music industry was phasing out the single. So you couldn't just buy the one song that you wanted, as we had been doing since the dawn of recorded music. So what we saw was Apple, through iTunes, using the iPod, deconstructing or heralding the end of the traditional album because you no longer had to buy all those records or all those uh, all those songs you didn't want you could just buy the songs you wanted and that has put us on the road to streaming where it's not about the album anymore it's about individual songs that's the biggest thing that itunes and the ipod did i i, I get that and i guess that is a, a brave step forward for consumer choice and and obviously only paying for what you want but on the flip side i wonder if it I wonder if there was a downside to that. Namely, when you bought the album, you might sort of accidentally bump into a song that you didn't know about, but that, as it turns out, you actually love, and it becomes part of the soundtrack of your life. There's less of a chance of that happening now. Isn't that the case? I, I, I totally, completely agree. I mean, earlier this year, we had uh, a situation with Adele who demanded that Spotify remove the shuffle option or at least cripple the shuffle option on her album because the whole thing was meant to be listened to in a certain order as a whole. And that has been the way it's been for, for a lot of records. I mean, we think about all the concept records that we started getting in the 1960s all the way through to today. That is essentially a, a little mini opera where you're supposed to follow the libretto and everything has to be unfolded in a specific order. Uh, it's, it's really difficult to imagine uh, anybody making an album like Pink Floyd's The Wall or Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band or even Green Day's American Idiot today because those are uh, pieces of art that are meant to be consumed as a whole, not by the individual tracks. Which is which is one of the sad things about the demise of the album. I I, I think we're, we're the album is still the currency of the recorded music industry, and it's still by which so many things are measured, including things like awards programs and so on. But uh, we're starting to really see the the album uh, lose currency um, in 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 favor of individual songs. You know the hip hop community has got this really figured out you you drip 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 songs out and you don't you know wait two three years between albums uh, or you put out an ep or you put out a mixtape it's all about making sure that your audience is serviced on a regular and timely basis rather than the old model of you know like u2 for example will put out an album tour behind it for four years and then disappear for another two hmm. Now, can't I know do that anymore. L LPs, or I guess what we used to call back in the day the long play vinyl record, they have made a comeback. They, they I guess, went away for a while, but they have made a comeback and they're kind of cool again. But I wonder whether you mm. think the iPod really put to death, if you like, cassettes and CDs and those alternate ways of playing music. Well, they, they certainly did because uh, a cassette, it was bulky. Uh, I, I have a, a great hate for cassettes. Anybody who romanticizes and fetishizes uh, cassettes today never had to live through the, the period when they melted on your dashboard or got uh, completely you know, snarled in your cassette player or you had to have a, a box of these things rattling around on the floor of your car. Uh, no, 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 thank you. Um, you also had the hassles of fast forwarding and rewinding. You didn't have the ability to skip back and forth. Um, with with uh, portable CD players, they had some buffering, so you would, you know, some of them would say that well, you could uh, you had a twenty second skip protection on it, which which meant that uh, every twenty seconds it would skip. You know, <laughs> it's essentially <laughs> what happened. Uh, and and then. Um, 
Vinyl LPs were, were never were never portable beyond the 1950s. Back in the 1950s, you could get something called the Highway Hi-Fi, which was actually an under-dash uh, turntable that Chrysler and DeSoto sold for a little while. Uh, but, you know, vinyl is was one of those things where uh, you have to pay attention as you're preparing to listen to it, as you're listening to it, and as you're putting it away. It is, uh, for some people, it is, uh, vinyl has become this thing where... Uh, it's proof of how much inconvenience you are willing to display to show everybody just how much more you love music than everybody else. <laughs> See, I have to I have to sit at home in front of the stereo listening to it. I have to take it off the shelf. I, if I want to skip a song, I have to get up and walk across the room. Uh, but at the same time, it's this 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 visceral thing. You have to hold it in your hands. You can look at the liner notes. You can read the lyrics. You can uh, try and you know, figure out what the artwork means. It's, it's got a it's beautiful a really, picture on the cover. Completely. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we're finding is that, yes, the older generations are, are you know, rediscovering vinyl or, or pulling out their old vinyl. But the large, the large cohort, the largest cohort of, of people purchasing vinyl, brand new vinyl records right now, is Generation Z. Hmm. Uh, the, 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 the digital nomads, the kids that grew up uh, with always on internet. And they're finding that this is an interesting um, addition to the uh, the ephemeral, evanescent music that they've enjoyed all their lives. It's something that they can touch and hold and feel, uh, and 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 put on a shelf. You know, there's something to be said for for somebody who comes into your house, and you can say, "See how much I love music. I have dedicated." 14 linear feet on my wall <laughs> to to my music. You can see it. <laughs> we have a guest who comes on this program from time to time named Armin Yalnesian, who's a wonderful economist, and she always has in her backdrop of her shot a wall full of albums. She must have 10,000 LP albums on the shelf. Mm -hmm. She's the only one I've seen do this, and it is. All, I agree. It makes a heck of a wonderful statement the way she has all that in the backdrop. But you told us earlier that you know once the iPhone came along, you kind of didn't really need an iPod anymore. So I guess the the question I should ask is: Is the iPod here on its 20th anniversary already obsolete? It is. Uh, if you want a dedicated. MP3 player, you can get one really, really cheap that works really, really well. Um, Apple is all about selling iPhones right now because that is the bread and butter of the company. And uh, frankly, you can get an iPhone for you know a couple hundred dollars, which was far, far less than what you would have to pay for an original iPhone uh, back in 2001. And you know that I think it was $599 Canadian, and that's in 2001 dollars. So uh, you know, get an iPhone phone and just don't use the just don't put a sim card in it i mean that's that's really what it, what it comes down to mm -hmm. uh i w we've got about five minutes and change left and i want to take advantage of the fact that you are here um mm. as one of the truly great radio personalities uh, observers of the music scene in canadian music history in radio history uh, as we said off the top 40 years in the business now can I just ask you what got you? I know you made this joke about no other, you know, transferable skills to anything else. But the fact of the matter is, you really have found your lane. But how did you start out in that lane and know that it was going to be radio for you in the first place? My grandmother gave me a transistor radio, a Lloyd's five transistor transistor radio for my birthday, my sixth birthday. And my parents didn't ask her to give me one. I didn't ask for one. She, there's no reason for her to give me one. But yet, I, I, this was my first exposure to my own program. I could choose my own programming. Because up until that point, I could only listen to whatever mom and dad listened to from the radio on the kitchen counter or in the car. With my own little radio, I was free to discover all this audio, all this entertainment, all this news, all this information coming from somewhere. And I found it absolutely magical. And it, from the moment I got that radio, I, we, I was inseparable. Um, I would put it on my pillow listening to music, falling asleep, and my mom would have to come and turn it off and, and put it on, on the uh, on the nightstand. Uh, that was really it. I decided that I wanted to do something that brought this weird connection from out of the ether to, to, to people. Um, I, I would pester my dad. We would go to our radio stations. If somebody was doing a remote at a, funer uh, at a furniture store, I would <laughs> insist that we stop and watch the guy do his, his live commercial. It just became something I, I had in mind uh, from age six. 
That's amazing. And uh, I know it's called 102.1 The Edge today, but I guess when you got there, it was called CFNY, and it was the alternative <laughs> voice of radio. How'd you end up there? Uh, very. I had a fight with my program director in Winnipeg. We. I decided that we weren't getting along, so I started blindly applying to radio stations across the country to get out of that particular position. And uh, the last place I applied to with CFNY, and I had, I didn't know much about the radio station. I didn't know much about the music. I just knew that it was near Toronto. It was based in Brampton at the time, and that I had to get out. And uh, I never heard from any of those other radio stations. And five days later, I was hired. Uh, and appeared, I, I drove up and got to reception on October 3rd, 1986, at 12 noon, the exact moment that they had the sod turning ceremony for the construction of the Sky Dome. So I am as old as the Sky Dome in Toronto. <laughs> okay. Um, that's pretty cool. Y you know, you think about that, that probably can't happen today, right? No, I, 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 everything has, has changed so much about media in general, radio specifically. Radio used to be one of the only games in town. Now there's so many other things that people are occupying their time with. Uh, but radio, let's be very clear, is still very powerful, very profitable, uh, and very popular. I mean, more than 85% uh, of the Canadian population listens to radio every week. It's still the, th the main thing that we listen to in the car. So it is a, uh, a very powerful medium still. It does have to evolve with the digital age, but because it's working well and because we have to evolve at the same time as we're doing a good job, it's kind of like changing the wings on an airplane flying at 38,000 feet. Hmm. We got to do it. It's just going to be tricky. Yeah. Are you as bullish about the future of AM as you are FM? AM is, is disappearing very quickly. It is the oldest of all the radio broadcasting mediums. Uh, the, the issue is that is there enough space on the FM band for these radios to make the transition over. Uh, we would need some regulatory changes to make uh, some of this happen. And uh, we'll see what happens with Bill C-10 when it finally gets introduced, because there's going to probably be some changes to to what is allowed and what is not allowed in, in broadcasting in Canada. And they will be looking at the fate of AM radio stations going forward. Okay, let me get back to you. So 19 in the 1980s, you get to CFNY, 1993, you create this show, The Ongoing History of New Music. What what did you imagine the mission of that show to be when you created it? I didn't create it. I was forced to do it. Hmm. I, the, we had new management at the time, and uh, they were thinking about changing the radio station over to country. But then they realized that there was you know, these bands uh, like Pearl Jam and, and Soundgarden and Nirvana and Red Hot Chili Peppers and so on. Uh, okay, we're going to stick with this music, but we really need to educate the audience about what we're doing. So the best way to do that, and back in the day we had to have all these regulation required programs called foreground music programming the idea was that we're going to we're going to create a, a one-hour documentary that's going to explain to our new listeners and our old listeners what this music is all about so they looked around the staff and they found exactly one person with a history degree me <laughs> and they assigned it to me and i said i, I don't want to do it because i was happy playing records in the afternoon i was working from two until six every day and it was fantastic uh, but they said no you're going to do it or we'll you know give you a nice little package and you can find something else to do. Now, I had just been married. I had just built a house. Uh, I had to do something, so I accepted the their offer. <laughs> and uh, a after one program, they when they listened to it and saw what I was going to do with it, uh, they just left me alone. And um, I'm currently writing program number 947. Unbelievable. It's almost 30 years. You're still going strong. Good for you. We've got yes. about a, a minute and a half to go here, and I do want to ask you about the science of song, how and why we make music. This is a new book that you've got out. What are you trying to achieve with this? A couple of years ago, I did a, I was part of a traveling science museum exhibit called The Science of Rock and Roll. We were at the Ontario Science Center for about six months, and we toured to some other places. And when this was all over, I had all this research, and I thought, well, I just can't let this go. I mean, the, the exhibit's over, but there's all this good stuff here. And while the exhibit was on, no matter where we went, and we were in Kansas City and Detroit and a bunch of other places, I saw a lot of kids really, really getting involved in, in the displays. So I thought, well, why don't we turn this into a kid's book? And uh, I work for, my main client is Chorus Entertainment. They have a division called Kids Can Press, which is a, a fantastic children's publishing uh, division. And uh, we, I said, hey, we wanna do this? And they said, okay. So uh, I gave them a couple of 
manuscripts and then they gave me some help because I apparently don't really speak child very well. Uh, so they translated it a bit and uh, this is the result. It came out on September the 7th and apparently is doing quite well. We wish you well with that. We wish you continued success with the ongoing history of new music. We congratulate you on 40 years on the radio and Alan, we're always delighted when you appear on TVO. Alan Cross, thanks so much again. Glad to be here. Thanks, Steve. In the early days of the pandemic, there were front porch sing-alongs and not an instrument rental to be found. Almost two years in, music has continued in all its many forms to be vital for many people coping with isolation and disruption. And to look at the output of some musicians, it's even meant thriving in these strange days. With us for their thoughts on how music shaped this second year of the pandemic, all of them in the provincial capital, starting in the West End in Etobicoke, let's welcome Samika Wilson, a freelance culture writer. In the East End, Elamine Abdul Mahmoud, culture writer at BuzzFeed News. And in the Annex, Megan Lapierre, staff writer at Exclaim Magazine. And we're delighted to welcome you three onto TVO tonight. And, and just before we start here, Elamine, I've got to say, you look eerily familiar to an Elamine <laughs> Abdul Mahmoud who used to work here at TVO many years ago. Are you the same guy by chance? Absolutely no <laughs> relation. I don't know who you're talking about. Okay, got it, got it. Hi again, Elamine. It's nice to have you back on our airwaves. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, having said that, you, you, you stand aside for a second because I'm going to talk to your friends first. Samiko, I'd like to know how you would describe your relationship with music in the year 2021. Oh boy, where should I start? I think that music was such an incredible way to maintain a sense of normalcy during an entirely abnormal year. Not being able to attend shows was tough, but I think that it was a great way to stay connected with my friends, to kind of maintain the same cultural diet and feel connected to everything that was going on when we were so disconnected. Megan, how about you? Yeah, I totally echo all of Samiko's thoughts. And I think it's really interesting to think about the way the pandemic has sort of changed the daily experience of time and the way we decorate it with music has has definitely changed with that and i think 2021 has been especially great because we moved a little bit past the nostalgia that comforted us in the early days of the pandemic and had more of an appetite for for new music and discovering new artists to love and lamine you get to bat clean up here well, I mean, I, maybe I'll do a combo of those uh, those ideas, because for me, music was a way to mark time as we went through this year. You know, I remember January because I remember the Olivia Rodrigo album, and I remember August because I remember the really messy Kanye West rollout. Like, for me, you know, because we're not really making a lot of new memories during this pandemic, uh, the, the, the memories that I do have tend to be pop culture moments, and they tend to be music moments particularly, you know, like when a certain album entered my life or when a certain, you know, um, musician did something publicly that was really interesting to me. Um, that's, uh, if, if it wasn't for music, I would have no idea what month it is. So happy birthday, <laughs> Taylor Swift, you know? Oh, right on. Okay. How old is she? She's 32. 32 years old. Wonderful. I actually know who that is, just so you know, Elamine. I, I do know who Taylor Swift is. Even though we just had Mr. Sinatra's birthday, I think 106. I think it was 106th birthday a little while ago, uh, just this past weekend. I do know who Taylor Swift is, though. Megan, follow up on that, if you would. And that is, you know, one of the things that music, one of the things we really needed music to do for us over the past 19 months in particular is to, is to help us through the loneliness and the isolation of a COVID-19 pandemic in ways that were even more dramatic than, than, say, music usually performs that role for us. Can you help us understand the role you think music played in that regard? Yeah, I think it was huge for staying connected. And I think we often think of listening to music as kind of a solitary activity, but it's always connective, even if you're just connecting sort of one-sided to the artists you're listening to. I think it has been a huge source of comfort and and bonding even with the people already in your circle, with other people just, you know, posting a song to their Instagram stories. I'm one of those people that actually clicks through and listens, and it can just open up the world to, to new forms of connection. So, Mika, was music even more important in the last 19 months than otherwise as it relates to isolation, loneliness, that kind of thing? 
Absolutely. It makes me think of there's like this psychotherapy exercise where it says like name 10 things you can see, 10 things you can feel, 10 things you can smell. And for me, it was like name 10 songs you can listen to. What are 10 songs you like? It was a way of maintaining a sense of normalcy for sure. Elamine, how about you on that? I guess I, I found myself, you know, evoking space a lot as I was listening to music, you know, as music, as new albums came out, I started thinking about what would this album sound like in a room full of crowded people? What would it sound like as if I'm just like driving past a place or walking past a place and they're blasting these songs of this album? So for me, I sort of went to that imagining place. Like I can't imagine the Doja Cat album, like not on the, you know, the, the, the dance floor of some kind of club somewhere. It's really hard for me to imagine that. And so like listening to that solitarily made me have to go to like the imaginative space of saying, okay, where would this album actually sound best? What is this album designed to do? And that was uh, strangely like a really warm connective experience in the sense that you start thinking about outside of your immediate uh, sort of environment. Elamine, maybe follow up with this, and, and I'm really not trying to sound like all three of your fathers here, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, but when I was your age, we used to do things called making a mixtape for somebody. And it was on a cassette. This is before CDs. And I gather nowadays you guys do this like Spotify blend feature or something where you all make playlists and then share playlists with each other. How, 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 I mean, I guess it's, is it the same phenomenon basically as making a mixtape, Elamine? Yeah, it's the same phenomenon, just way easier than you had it, Steve. So, you know, <laughs> we just have to add a playlist, uh, had as long to, you know, a playlist that you want. And so like, I found myself like making playlists for some friends who are going through tough times, making playlists for friends who are saying, you know what, I've never heard of this artist. Can you get me into them? Can you figure out a way for me to get into them? And I was like, yes, of course, I can do that for you. Um, I have a friend named Ali who, uh, she's a runner and she has been inviting me to constantly sort of make her um, running playlist. And I like get a lot of joy out of doing that. Um, and it's just a way of saying, you know what? I took 25 minutes to think about you and think about an order of songs and then send them to you because I think these songs should play a role in your life. Um, the, the songs are the vehicle, but the connection is, is the point. Of course. Hmm. Okay, Samiko, so explain this to me. There, um, there might be a different playlist for cooking, a different playlist for running, a different playlist for going for a walk in the park. I don't know. Is that how it works? Absolutely. You need different vibes for different things. And I think that it's also a way to like, when we were isolated to the same space, it was a way to like mark different activities, mark different rituals. And also I think that it was a great way to connect with like possible suitors. I know that on like uh, dating apps, you can connect your Spotify or your Apple music. And it was a cool way to see if people have the same taste as you. Really? So that's how it works. So you, 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 uh, you don't necessarily exchange pictures, you're exchanging playlists now. That's how you get to know about somebody? Pictures and playlists. Pictures and playlists, okay, I got it. Yeah. Uh, Megan, how about you? Did you make any playlists for friends this past year? Oh, absolutely. It's one of my favorite things to do. But I also think playlists are a really cool way to discover new artists. Um, one of my passion projects this year has been working on a playlist of new Canadian music releases every week um, called The A-List, which has introduced me to so many new artists that I am super passionate about. And I think, you know, building off of what Samiko and Elohim said, it's so much about moods and finding music to suit whatever mood you're working with. And I think, yeah, we were a little bit more introspective in 2020 and 2021 and kind of got in touch with our emotions and our fluctuations more. And music was the perfect accompaniment to those oscillating rhythms. Now, Samiko, I have a terrible confession to make here, which is I mm -hmm. haven't made anybody else a playlist uh, or, or one for my own, for that matter, on Spotify this past year. And it may well be because I'm just... Um, well, I don't know. Am I from a generation that just doesn't do these kinds of things? And if I am, what am I missing out on? Well, given that you said you made mixtapes for people, I think that you were working out the same muscles you'd be <laughs> using if you made a playlist. Um, but I think it's a great release. It's a great way to connect with other people. And it's also, um, as Megan said, it's a great way to connect or, with new artists. Hmm. Are we, Elamine, missing out? Those, those of us who don't do this, are we missing out on something kind of significant and profound by not doing this? 
First of all, I was surprised that there are any of you left to begin with, but because like Spotify numbers are going up and up, you know, like there's you know, the, the user base has increased. A lot more people are using um, services like Apple Music and Spotify to share music with each other. There's a lot of family plans that are out there, like people who are sort of sharing a plan together for a premium subscription. So if you are among the few people who are not using a streaming service um, to share music with your family or with your friends, then I would say like there's just not that many of you left. So just by default, you're you're missing out. <laughs> okay, I, just just a pure numbers game. I, yeah, I, I'm just trying to understand. Was that an insult? I'm not sure, or maybe I am sure. Look, man, it's up to you. <laughs> However you want to interpret. <laughs> I gotcha. I gotcha. Um, Megan, follow up on that if you would. Given that I'm a complete novice at this and have no idea how to do it, uh, and you've known me now for all of uh, five or ten minutes, would you like to give me some advice on what kind of playlist I ought to put together for for a particular mood or, I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, where do we even begin? I think a lot of times if you're kind of feeling one song or album or artist, it makes sense to sort of move them into a space where you can connect them with other like songs and artists and just kind of keep that that general vibe going. But at the same time, I also don't like things that are too one note. So you kind of put things together that make sense, but also have, you know, sort of peaks and valleys in the playlist. It's It can be like a narrative in that way and a really interesting way to even sort of remember a different period of time. And Elamine, would it be a problem if none of the songs on the playlist was say, um, written after 1980? It wouldn't, not at all, not at all. I certainly have a lot of playlists that um, that sort of are decade, you know, decade specific. Um, certainly some 60s uh, playlists, some 70s playlists. So no, that's not a problem at all. But having said that, like, I think that the main through line here is for you to curate a mood. Like you're trying to curate some kind of um, general vibe that you're going for and like how certain songs fit together or how they might be in relationship with one another, even if they're not necessarily in the same mood. Gotcha. Well, let's focus on Canada here and some of the Canadian artists that have really captured your attention in 2021. Uh, Elamine, start us off. In your view, how are they shaping the international music scene today? I mean, you know, honestly, I think probably my favorite album of the year was Mustafa's album. Mustafa, people know as Mustafa the Poet. Um, he has done like just like some incredible work. And, you know, it's really nice to see him end up on some New York Times best of the year uh, playlist and that kind of thing. Uh, so I would say that like that's that's where I would start personally. Sumiko, so what starts off your list? Oh my gosh, where should I start? I think that Emmanuel had an incredible album this year. He's an artist from London who last night was featured on HBO's Insecure. Um, there's an artist from Vancouver named Boslin who's kind of like, if you're into Travis Scott, he's a great continuation of that sonic narrative. And then there's an artist named Skyfall or Skifall from Montreal, and he's like a UK drill derivative, which is so unique, so different, so incredible. Okay, Megan, what's on your list? Um, topping my album of the year list was a band called Zolas from Vancouver. Uh, it was their fourth album, but they really sort of hit their stride on this one and everything came together. But there were so many amazing Canadian artists that released albums. We had The Weather Station, we had Cadence Weapon, we had Child. Um, it was it was really a landmark year for, for Canadian artists sort of putting together a body of work um, that that really stepped their games up. Elamine, I saw the Arkells perform at the halftime show at the Grey Cup. Do I get any props for that at all? Uh, you do, but only insofar as you are likely to watch anything that is Hamilton related. Arkells, of course, um, <laughs> Hamilton's band. And so I guess like that's, it's kind of within your wheelhouse. You know, it's within part of the job description of being a Hamiltonian makes sense for you. So you're not giving me any extra credit for that because I'm really not pushing at the edges of my comfort zone with that one, am I? Not, not at all. You're, <laughs> not it's it's the, the Grey Cup is in Hamilton. The Arkells are from Hamilton. It's, this is a lot of Hamilton going on. I get you. I get you. Okay. Uh, let's, Sheldon, should we bring this up here? Should we bring this next graphic up? Let's talk about uh, All Eyes on the North, and uh, I've actually, you'll be shocked to hear, I've heard of all these guys. Drake and Justin Bieber made it to Spotify's top five most streamed artists globally. How about that? Justin Bieber received eight nominations for the 2022 Grammy Awards. The Weeknd is named Global Artist of the Year by the Apple Music Awards. And 17-year-old Tate McRae is among Forbes' 30 under 30 
in the music category. Now, these are big name folks, and everybody knows these guys. But uh, Samiko, uh, I know you're into the R&B and the hip hop and that kind of stuff. And let's show, again, Sheldon, let's bring this up here. Cover art for one of your articles for Complex. Talk to us about 2021 and how big a year it was for new artists in those genres in particular that you'd like to focus on. Well, I think that hip hop and R&B in Canada sounded a lot different than it previously had before. It was a lot like sounding like Drake, to be frank. It was a lot like sounding like what had been popular and what had been cool. But this was less about like a return to form, as I said in that article, and more like elevating the game altogether. And I think that, like I said, artists like Skeeval did that very well. Artists like Pressa did that well, Smiley. And my top album of the year, which made it to number two on Complex's list, was Certified Lover Boy by Drake. I am part of the small minority of people who were obsessed with that album. Oh, I see head shaking. Elamine, what's wrong? <laughs> oh, I just I just can't relate. Uh, I'm, so, I'm so sorry for you, Samiko. I feel so terrible. Um, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm only saying this because that was, um, I think, for me, um, a, a sort of middle of the road Drake effort. It's got some bangers. It's got some songs that are like, why are we doing this still, Drake? Um, and so that's that's just where I stood on that album. And so that's I was shaking my head, sort of mercifully thinking, hey, I'm off camera. I get to just sort of shake my head and put this. <laughs> but now I've been called out on it. So now I have to talk about how this album was, I'm so sorry to say, maybe the fourth best Drake album, fifth, I don't know. It's pretty low on the list for me. So Miko, do you want to convince him of the error of his ways? Oh man, where should I start? I think that it was such a meta Drake album because I think that all Drake albums kind of continue the similar narrative. As I said in the piece that you showed previously, um, sorry, <laughs> as I said in the piece that you showed previously, all Drake albums sound very similar. I think that like any song on any Drake album could be on any other Drake album and it would still be great. He knows what works and he sticks to it. Megan, you want to break the tie on this? Oh man, I I feel unqualified to speak on this really. Um, <laughs> because I don't particular, I'm just lost on the Drake narrative, honestly. I mm. I was in it and then I just sort of fell out of it. And this album, I don't think I made it all the way through, honestly. Ooh. Well, sorry, Smiko. I'm, sure, I'm sure there are redeeming qualities. I know, I know. Shun me. I'm a revoke my citizenship, honestly. But I mean, good for him. <laughs> Megan, what happened? That's that's a pretty serious diss. What happened there? I it's it's just a lot of the same now. Like, like Samiko said, it, there is sort of a continuing narrative, which can be really interesting, but also get a little stale. Um, and it's just, I'm, I'm waiting to, to get back on the bandwagon. I'm sure it'll happen. Huh. Samiko, what did you clearly hear in that album that your friends here did not? Well, as I mentioned, I think that Drake knows what works and he sticks to it. Um, but he also kind of knows what his fans want and sprinkles it into every single album. There were some club bangers like Way Too Sexy. He was a little revelatory on his personal life in the intro Champagne Poetry. Elamine, you can't tell me that you didn't listen to Champagne Poetry and get full chills when the beat switched midway through. It was very cinematic, very theatrical. I likened the first song to like the opening number of a musical because it just felt very epic to me. I mean? Listen, Drake, Drake knows how to open albums for sure. Drake knows how to put in some bangers. Um, I think this album should have been maybe seven songs shorter and then it would have been some kind of narrative to be held and dealt with. And I say this as like a fan of the last record. I say this as a fan of Scorpion, which was like, you know, it was sprawling, but also it explored all of his sides kind of fully. Um, and then you get to this one and it just like, as an album, it felt incoherent. And maybe the problem is this album or Drake himself, maybe it's like the concept of the album. Like maybe we're moving away from the idea and the, the urgency of, of, of here's an album, here's a coherent thing from start to end. Um, and, and Drake might be just kind of like reaching the edges of that. Um, and he, he was also getting at something when, you know, he, he named more life as a playlist and not an album. Like to me, like, yeah, that makes sense. That is a, a strategic business move on his part that also reduces the expectations. But when you say, here's an album, I'm expecting like just, just some, like a body of work that says something. And he himself has set his own bar and he just didn't mean it for me. Well, notwithstanding this disagreement over Drake, and uh, of course we have the Beebs as well and The weekend, they are all 
huge on the music scene. I do want to ask uh, Megan about maybe some of the uh, less appreciated or lesser, na lesser known names from the past year who you think deserve some attention. Oh my gosh, there's so many. Like I said, I feel like it's been a, a, a year where we had an appetite for more new music than we previously did when we were sort of leaning on our, our comfort things. And so many up and coming Canadian artists were brought to my attention this year. Many of them sort of releasing debut projects, but not even um, not even all of them, even some people further into their careers that I'm just like, how did I not <laughs> know this before? But I loved, um, there's a band from Montreal called Afternoon Bike Ride. There's Ada Lee. There's so many Canadian artists that are, have just burst onto the scene. And I, I love finding out about new ones. Like I, I'm literally overwhelmed with names right now in my head, trying to think of people to say. <laughs> gotcha. Well, okay. So Miko, maybe follow up on that by, by saying, what are some of the qualities that you are seeing in artists who emerged over 2021? I think that there's a global quality to all of the artists who emerged in 2021 because we weren't limited to just one sonic narrative in Canada. We were kind of like opened up to the entire world because the internet did that and we were spent so much time online. So I think that they sounded a lot more international in 2021. Hmm. Okay, let's move on now and talk about uh, the way in which we watched a lot of concerts this past year because of course, until recently, we weren't allowed to go to concerts because they didn't have any. Uh, as a result, we watched a lot of concerts, be they of the kind of music that your generation listens to or maybe some of the stuff uh, older generations listen to, online. And they were live, but they were online. And I want to know, Elamine, start us off here. Oh, somebody's desperately trying to make a cameo appearance in the background there. That's very, uh, that's very cute. Whose dog is that, and what's his or her name? It's my dog, Kitty. Uh, <laughs> can she take a cue, or what? I am so sorry. She <laughs> is being very unprofessional right now. <laughs> it looks like she's being escorted out right now. Oh, OK. Yeah, sorry about that. Not a problem. No, we, we got to hear her, which is nice. And maybe next time, she'll grace us with an appearance on camera. That's fine. She was backing <laughs> me up on my thoughts on the Drake album. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, Elamine, start us off on this. Um, the difference between going to a live concert and experiencing it that way versus how we sort of had to make do during the pandemic by watching live concerts on our screens. How did it work you know, for you? I, I have to say that uh, when, when artists started offering live stream concerts, I was genuinely really skeptical of the enterprise. I was like, what are we doing here? Like nothing can really replace the feeling of live music, the feeling of people being in the room um, and interacting with the artists and how that is shaping the music and how they're playing their music. Um, but then I went to, what did I, I went to, I bought a ticket um, to a live stream my, of my first virtual concert, which was Brandy Carlisle earlier this year. And I, as I was watching it, I was like, you know what? This is an approximation of the real thing. This is, a, this is an approximation of the feeling that I get because an artist is not playing through the studio version of their song. They're sort of feeling the song as they go, and I'm having an emotional reaction to that. It feels more intimate in a way because I'm not, um, you know, I'm not, it's the experience is not mediated through other people's reactions to the artist. Um, but also, of course, something is missing, and like, there's nothing that can replace live music. And so um, I'm happy to say that like, I've been back to a few, you know, in-person concerts um, this fall, and uh, my body's like, oh yes, this is this is what we remember. This is what we love. This is the thing that you know. This is what we come here for. Samiko, so, how about you? The the attempt to keep music going online did it work for you? So like Elamine, I was extremely skeptical. I didn't think it could work, but something called Versus emerged and that did an excellent job of capturing the excitement of a live concert, but also capturing the community of it. Reading the Versus comments was probably one of the highlights of the pandemic for me. So funny. It felt so warm. It felt like you were watching it on the couch with your family. Um, and it felt like a return to form. It felt like we were there live. Just tell us a little bit more about Versus for those who don't know what it is. Yeah, so Versus was started by Swiss Beats and Timbaland on Instagram, and it's where two big artists basically, like, fight to the death 
sonically on their discography playing all of their greatest hits and then i think that there's a voting element i've never personally voted but um yeah it's really fun it's i think monthly and um yeah it's been a great highlight this pandemic megan how about for you did the online how far did it go in replacing the real thing well, of course, there's there's no substitute. And while I was skeptical, I was also really sort of excited by the shift to live stream shows because there's always the accessibility element to consider. And as the pandemic went on, I feel like I saw more and more accessibility features added to these live stream concerts like ASL um, captioning and things like that. All of it just made me think, rethink about, you know, the privilege of getting to access live music spaces and how many of mm. those aren't accessible to so many people. And, you know, this was a great way to sort of reassess what, what we should be doing with live shows next. Having said that, Elamine, did you get to a point, you yourself, where you thought, I just can't watch another concert online. I've got to get back into a music hall and see the real thing. I mean, of course, eventually I got there, but I will have to say that like one of the highlights of the year was um, as Kanye West was rolling out his album, um, his ninth album, Donda, there was like this like huge moment where he did two um, different sort of live stream concerts. Um, there are supposed to be listening parties. He's sort of showcasing the music. He's not even performing, he's just showcasing the music. And I found myself like really moved by those performances, really moved by getting to hear the music for the first time. Um, you're essentially watching a stadium react to this, to this stuff. And I thought like this could work. Like, there's certainly a future for um, live stream concerts um, that I think would get us excited. Just like the, the, the act of knowing that it's live. I don't think I would want to go back and watch something that is like, you know, on demand. But I think like the idea of watching it as it unfolds live on your screen is something that is exciting. Um, but then finally when the fall came and I was able to go to some concerts, you know, I, I they, like, you know, two notes into a guitar being played. I was like, oh no, nothing can replace this. Right. Megan, have you been to any actual in-person concerts lately? I have, and? and it has been such an interesting re reemerging into the culture. And I feel like I had kind of very different experiences at, I think I've been to four now. And just depending on the venue, depending on how many people were, were there, it, it it's weird because it's not comfortable the way that it used to be. The first one I went to was the big Arkell's comeback show in Toronto this summer. And I was so uncomfortable when I first got there and even just throughout I it was so weird to be surrounded by this many people but at the same time there were moments where I was able to completely forget about that and just be like oh yeah <laughs> I remember now this is this is the zone that I want to be in and this is this is something special that I don't know if live streams can quite touch um, but yeah, it's, it's been really amazing getting to, to come back to live music, even though it's not, it, it doesn't feel the exact same to me anymore. I, I have to be honest. It's, there's a, there's an added layer of, of sort of caution, um, that wasn't there before. Well, of course. I mean, you, if you, if you look around and you see, uh, a whole bunch of people with masks on, you know, it's a different experience. Um, well, Samiko, I could, I should ask you, have you been to any in-person concerts of late? I went to my first one last Tuesday. I saw Emmanuel, who I mentioned earlier, the artist from London, and it was incredible. Megan, it also took me a really long time to take my mask down, but once I did, it was so amazing to see hundreds of people gathered to see this artist performing for the first time, this artist, uh, this uh, project that he created during the pandemic. It was incomparable. What venue was it at? It was at... What was formerly the Mod Club, I don't know what the new name is, but it was, I believe, like six or 700 people packed in there to see this artist from London. It was so special. And did they keep their masks on, the people in there? Honestly, no, which was terrifying for me. Hmm. Elamine, how about you? People masking up when they go to shows? Well, it's funny that Megan mentioned that Arkell's concert. I was at that Arkell's concert, um, and it was also it was my first show back. You know, it was everybody's first show back. I think it was like right after they relaxed the regulations in terms of um, gatherings and, and public concerts. Um, and it was an outdoor show, and it's for the first few songs as the Arkells come on, um, the, the folks who are not wearing their masks 
all I can think about is like, there are a lot of droplets flying around everywhere, man. Um, but then I think like, maybe you get to the second or third song um, and you just kind of relax into the music and you let yourself enjoy the show. But I think the fact that that warning has to come up um, at the beginning is just like, it's unnat it's, it's just like naturally can't be avoided. Did you ever, Elamine, get to the point where you were able to forget about the fact that you were surrounded by a lot of potentially unmasked people in the middle of a global pandemic? Could you, could you shut all that out and just really get into the music? I could. I could, yes, but I also I completely could see that how other people could not. I, you know, it's, I, I can't... That is not a universalizable experience. You can't expect music to do the same thing for everybody there. Um, but for me personally, yes, I could. Hmm. Well, I have to tell you, I'm just a little bit surprised that not one of you mentioned what was clearly the musical event of the past year, 2021. And Elamine smiling. I, you, you don't know what I'm going to say yet. You don't know. I don't. I you, don't. You can probably guess, though. Uh, I thought uh, Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga were absolutely scrumtralescent together, and that one was just one for the ages. And if you didn't see it, you should go find it somewhere because it'll just make you cry to see a 95-year-old man with Alzheimer's who, who really can't function in the rest of his world get on stage and be transported back 20, 30, 40, 50 years and knows all the lyrics and she's amazing and that really was just spectacular. Anyway, that's my two cents on this. <laughs> I want to thank Samiko Wilson and Megan Lapierre and Elamine Abdul Mahmoud for joining us on TVO tonight for this great look back at music in 2021. Thanks so much, you three. Thank you. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, December 14th, 2021. Tomorrow, we'll learn how a group of millennial mobsters brought the violence and brutality of the drug cartels to Canada. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The Agenda is always on. To catch up on conversations from this week or any week, visit our website, tvo.org slash the agenda, or our YouTube page at youtube.com slash the agenda. It's all there for whenever you want to watch. Pourquoi a nouvel opéra? It was a monumental project building a new opera house in Paris to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the revolution. Il y a des compétitions internationales anonymes. But no one expected an unknown Canadian architect, Carlos Ott, would get the assignment. Carlos was in a state of shock. And he asked me, Where, uh, where's your team? And I said, well, the team is me. And then the crazy time started. Impossible deadlines. See, now we have one year, not more, not less. Warring political titans. And all of them hate you. They hate your opera. They hate me to run. And an inexperienced young architect. This was brain surgery, and you've never seen a brain before. What could go wrong? Bastille is like the Titanic. No, it's not like the Titanic. At least the Titanic had an orchestra when it sunk. But we were already convinced we will win it at the end. Building Bastille, the tangled and improbable story of the opera Bastille. Next on TVO. 19 years after he saved the Wizarding World, he's back in a new adventure. Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. A brave new generation of wizards continue the story on stage in this, the eighth Harry Potter tale. It's time to believe in magic.